I've been doing push-ups. Can any of you tell? There we go. Welcome back, friends. It's Anders. Today, on the Anders Ericsson channel, we are exploring the wide world of gin. Now, this is an essential ingredient behind your bar. It's an essential spirit. The history of gin is fascinating and rich and filled with a lot of lore that is probably not true. So when I was researching this video, there was a lot to sort through. I did my best. I am about to present to you my take on gin and how I understand it, because it is a little confusing. I am here to try to make sense of it all. So what we'll do is, well, I'm gonna go through the history. While I'm going through the history, I will introduce different styles of gin. We will taste them, I will taste them, um, and we are going to explore a number of bottles. I know that you've got a favorite bottle of gin, if you like gin, and I probably am not gonna talk about it because there are a million bottles of gin out there. Everybody's making gin. We are gonna talk about the oldest gins. We are gonna talk about the gin that your neighbor's making. Assuming your neighbor is a, a licensed distiller. Uh, if you're new to the channel, hit that subscribe button for more sips, tips, and recipes, and let's go talk about gin. To the bar. Gin. What is it? Gin is a distillate that is flavored with botanicals, most importantly, juniper berries. Now, if you don't have the juniper berries, you cannot call it gin. And there are different rules based on the style of gin you're making, but more or less, in a nutshell, that's what gin is. So how do we impart that flavor in the distillate? There's a couple ways. One, you could steep it in the gin while you're distilling it like a tea. The other way is using what is called a gin basket, where you take all of your botanicals and you hang it in the still so that the vapors during the distillation process pass through all the botanicals and that's how you get the flavor in the gin. Now there are a whole lot of styles of gin. I don't even know how many different styles there are. I, pr while we're making this video, there's probably a new style being born, but I am going to go over the ones that I think are important to know, this will help us along our gin journey. Now, the history of gin. To understand gin, we need to go back to the beginning, to a spirit known as Geneva, or Geneva, if you're Dutch. I never really know how to pronounce it, but I say Geneva, and I think a lot of people around me say that too, and that's why I say Geneva. Geneva is not technically considered a gin, but it's important that we talk about this because this is where it all stemmed from. Show it this camera. This stuff is old. It dates back to the 1200s. What it is, is essentially a malt grain spirit that has been infused with juniper berries. The reason why they infused it with juniper berries was because it was considered medicinal. The juniper berries were supposed to help with tummy aches, body aches, the plague. It also did help the flavor of the spirit. I should point out that Geneva is its own thing. Just as gins have evolved over the years, so has Geneva. In fact, now there are different categories and we go into depth on this in another video. Geneva tends to ride the line between whiskey and gin. Some Genevers are very close to gin and others are very close to whiskey. So it's a good segue if you're a whiskey drinker and you're looking to get into gin. Now this one here is really malty on the nose. That comes from the malted grain that is used in the spirit. Cheers. It's very good, but it's not gin. I get the maltiness more than anything. You get a little bit of those botanicals at the end, but it really is more about the malt grain spirit. Quite different than gin, but it is important that we touch on it. Now, fast forward a few hundred years to the late 1600s, early 1700s to England, where the English decided to make their own spirit that was called gin. Now, gin actually comes from the name Geneva, and the reason why they decided to start making their own is because they were importing all of their spirits, and King William decided to cut that off and say, no, we are going to make our own. This is gonna help the economy. This is going to grow our nation. And so everybody started making gin, but there were no regulations. Anybody and everybody could make gin, and they were making gin. Everybody was trying to make the cheapest gin they possibly could so that they could outsell all of their competition. Most of them were using chemicals like turpentine to mimic the flavor of juniper berries, and they were making poison. It was dirt cheap, everybody was getting drunk off the stuff, and it became a real problem. It was known as the gin craze. So this is not good for a country. And the powers that be saw that and said, okay, we need to, start making some regulations here. They basically said, we are going to make a three-tier system. We've got our distillers, our rectifiers, and our retailers. The distillers were not allowed to sell directly to the retailers. And 
they had to make a distillate that was no weaker than 61% alcohol. It had to be really strong. They could only sell it in bulk and it could not be flavored with anything. So then this became the job of the rectifier who would buy in bulk all of this raw spirit. They would redistill it and impart the flavors of the botanicals to give it the flavor of gin, and then they would cut it with water to bring the proof down so that they could sell it to the retailers. At the retailer level, they would further cut down that spirit in proof and sell it at various proof levels. They would also add sugar to this gin. So they were making what was called cordial gin, which is not really seen today. Uh, something that would be similar would be slow gin. The reason why I'm pulling this out is because a lot of people say that this is a style of gin, but technically speaking, it is too low in proof to be called a gin. This is called a gin liqueur. But back then, this was very common. In fact, the origins of slow gin date back to the early 1800s. It's an infusion of gin with sugar and slow berries, or berries of the blackthorn. I'm gonna pour myself a little taste, if you don't mind. Obviously, it's a different color. That's from the slow berries. Popular drink with slow gin would be a slow gin fizz. Uh, actually, maybe we should make one on the channel here. I haven't had a slow gin fizz in a long time, uh, but it also makes for a really interesting Negroni riff. Oh yeah, that's good. Plummy, fruit roll up -y, yummy. <laughs> it's, it's, it's not like gin. It's more of a liqueur, but this is the kind of thing that they were making back then. Now, from these cordial gins, we get what was called Old Tom Gin. Old Tom Gins were the ones that were cut the least, so they were the strongest of the cordial gins and they had the least amount of sugar added to them, but it's still a sweetened gin. Old Tom Gin disappeared for a long time, uh, and we'll get into why in a moment here, but it has made a comeback. It really grabbed a foothold in the United States at the birth of cocktails because it was called for in a drink like a Tom Collins or the Martinez. It does make for great cocktails. It does add a little bit of sweetness. That's really nice with the botanicals. I'm curious uh, to see how sweet it tastes after that slow gin. This is a local gin for me. Heyman's makes a, a classic Old Tom as well. Uh, and there are a few others out there. Ransom makes a barrel aged Old Tom. We'll talk about barrel aged in a moment. Cheers. I really love the nose on this gin. I love this gin. I'm gonna say it. Yeah, bright. I get like orange peel. Orange rind, you still get the, the botanicals from the, the juniper berries. Uh, and then there is that nice sweetness. So this one works on its own. It mixed into a drink, you do wanna take that sweetness into consideration, but it's a nice old style of gin. A good one to have behind your bar. Now, at some point, Old Tom Gin fell out of fashion. And that's because the general public's tastes started to lean towards drier spirits. This is all because of something that happened in the mid 1800s, and this was the birth of the coffee still, or column still, patent still, had a number of names. These were continuous stills. And what you get with a column still is a much cleaner, lighter spirit. You're essentially distilling over and over again, making a higher proof, more refined end product. And in that process, you are stripping away all of the, the nuances from the grain that you started with. So this really takes us further away from the Geneva here because now it relies more on the botanicals that you're adding. So dry gin became a thing because you didn't have to have all of that sugar to cover up the impurities that were in the other gins. Of the dry gins, London Dry is the classic and probably the gin most of us think of when it comes to gin. Got Beefeater here, Brokers as well, all the big name ones that you can think of, Bombay, Tanqueray, these are all great London Dry gins. Now it's going to be less sweet than the Old Tom, uh, but it works really well in a cocktail because you can then add sugar if you feel it's necessary. So on the nose, I get the Juniper, but also a brightness. It's bright, it's light, it's got strong flavor, but it's not over the top. London Dry is a classic gin that works in a number of cocktails from a martini to a Singapore sling. Obviously it was created, it originated in London, but you don't have to be making London Dry gin in London. In fact, a number of the big name London Dry gins are outside of the city of London. Uh, there are other specific rules though. Number one, it can't be sweetened. You also can't add any flavoring after the distillation process. It was highly regarded for a long time, and this entered what I think, in my mind, was a golden age of gin. But then, things happened. 
No, I don't wanna go there yet. I don't wanna go there yet. We will get there. What I wanna talk about are other dry gins. This one right here, which is one of my go-tos. I love the botanist. On the bottle, it says Isla dry gin. So we know it's a dry gin, but it says Isla, which is in Scotland. That's where you get the really big peaty whiskeys. Uh, another one of my favorites is the Martin Miller's. It's a really nice one. I like this one in a martini quite a bit. Again, this is not a London dry gin, but it is a dry gin. The nose is actually similar. Mm. I actually think I get a little bit more juniper in the botanist. I get more herbs, like woody notes, less fruity notes, but they are very comparable. Okay, so now on to another dry gin that is its own style. And this is kind of a fascinating thing. In fact, if I didn't love Plymouth gin so much, I would roll my eyes a little bit at the fact that it is its own style because this is the only gin that is making Plymouth gin. It's Plymouth gin. And it's made at the Blackfriars Distillery in Plymouth in England. Up until recently, you had to make Plymouth gin in the city of Plymouth. That's no longer the case, but I don't know anybody else that's making Plymouth gin. And Plymouth gin is honestly, might be my favorite gin out of all of them. It's a little rich. It goes really well in a number of cocktails and it's great on its own. So I'm gonna pour myself a little bit and talk about why it became so popular. Mm. Yeah, so Plymouth gin is made in a pot still. So you get a lot of body. It is a richer gin. Now, the reason why it was so successful is because there was a rather large naval port in Plymouth and the Navy back then went through a lot of gin. So they had a contract with Plymouth and that allowed Plymouth to flourish. The thing here is that from Plymouth, you get another style of gin, Navy strength gin. The Navy had to have a higher proof gin than what was being sold to the general public. The reason is they would store it in these barrels and they would keep them below deck right next to all of the gunpowder. And if that gin spills on your gunpowder, you wanna be sure that gunpowder still works. If the gin was a minimum of 57% alcohol by volume, it would still ignite. Now the term Navy strength doesn't go that far back. I'm guessing like, probably late 20th century, it was more of a marketing ploy, but the idea is the Navy got the strong stuff and it has become its own category of gin. So it's going to be stronger and hotter and it's really gonna stand out in your cocktail. So if you wanna taste the gin, go with the Navy Strength. They also have Navy Strength rums and it's the same idea. The Navy was drinking rum and they needed it high proof. So I am going, I am out of my Glencairns. I am going to bust out a different glass for our Navy Strength. Here we go. I've got the Tanglin Black Powder Gin, which is even hotter at 58%, but I do wanna taste the Plymouth Navy Strength against the Plymouth Original. It smells like Plymouth. Oh, that is good. It tastes like Plymouth, but the, the vapors get you up in, in your nose and it is just stronger. So, <laughs> excuse me while I have a little water. Mm. All right, so now, so this, these are all great. These are all wonderful examples of gin. And in the early 20th century, late 19th century, this was an exciting time for the spirit. However, in 1920, something happened in the United States called prohibition. And you couldn't have gin at all anymore. But it did create a new style that was called the New American Style, which is still a style today called New Western Style. It's also called Contemporary Gin. It's called a number of things. And what it is today is very different than what it was during Prohibition. During Prohibition, this was also called Bathtub Gin. This is not good stuff. This is essentially recreating what they were making during the gin craze. People wanted to drink even though they weren't allowed to. And or you could make a lot of money making cheap hooch. These people who are looking to make their own gin would buy industrial grade alcohol, which had additives that were poisonous, like serious poisons, because it was not intended to be ingested by humans and it made it taste awful. And so they would put into a wash basin. This is my understanding of how bathtub gin got its name, but I know there's a couple different stories. They would, in a wash basin, take all of this terrible alcohol and then add like a juniper syrup. Maybe they were adding turpentine. I don't know, you were tasting something different. And that was called bathtub gin, also called New American style. That really put a damper on 
respectable gins, in the United States anyway. Post-prohibition, all that stuff kind of got pushed to the side. Enough people got really sick, died, got went blind. A lot of bad things happened. And gin started to have a resurgence. However, then in the mid 20th century, vodka took over because people really just wanted a clean, light, crisp mixer that, uh, that didn't taste like anything. By the end of the 60s, vodka overtook gin as far as the clear spirit of choice. In fact, vodka took over the world and gin kind of took a back seat until the early 2000s where you have the cocktail renaissance. All of a sudden you start seeing all of these little distilleries pop up. And that's where we get all of these various expressions of gin. So that's where we are today. This is an exciting time for gin, I think. There are a lot of distilleries making all different styles of gin and no two bottles are exactly the same. This is where I am constantly exploring new things. So here we are. I'm gonna show you some that I have got in front of me. This is a really nice one called the Terroir Gin from St. George out in California. These are not bathtub gins. These are classy spirits, okay? Earthy, piney smell. This is unlike everything we've tasted. It tastes like a Christmas tree and it tastes like a forest floor. It's soft, it does have a gentle sweetness, uh, but it is so different than any of these others. That's just one example of the new American, and when I say American, it's not specific to America. This the new Western style, the contemporary gin style. I like to have a couple other bottles. I've got Journeyman Distillery, Death Store Distillery. The last category that I wanna to touch on here is barrel aged gin. Now this is not a new concept. People have been transporting gin in wooden barrels for a long time. However, the idea of using that wood and resting the gin on the wood to extract flavors is a relatively new one. And in our barrel aged gins, they are using ex bourbon barrels, other whiskey barrels, wine barrels, you name it, sherry, anything to extract different flavors. This is a tricky category of gin for moi because it's difficult to work with. This is from Koval, clearly you get a different color. So the color of this comes from the wood. You also get some of those woody flavors. So you're adding another level, another dimension of flavor to your gin. It's good, very herbal, kind of spicy. You do pick up some vanilla notes from the wood. This does start to take that gin in a slightly different direction. This one in particular, I would enjoy in something like a Negroni because those woody notes are gonna push it towards like a Boulevardier but still in the Negroni realm. So I know that it's gonna work. Barrel aged gins, I tend to drink neat or on the rocks more than mix with. That's just my own personal preference. There's nothing holding you back from mixing with a barrel aged gin. There's nothing holding you back from using any of these gins. These are the styles of gin that I find helpful to know about. And I hope that you find this helpful too. When you go into a liquor store, just know that styles of gin overlap. There are new styles being created all the time. No two bottles are the same. But that's kind of what's exciting about gin right now. Thank you for watching. Hope you enjoyed this. Don't forget your merch. Link in the description down below. Check out my collection on Curiata. I will see you next time. Cheers.